Nancy McLean, she teaches here at Duke. She is the William Chef Professor of History and Public Policy. She also holds an appointment in the program of Gender, Sexuality, and Feminist Studies. Uh, Nancy is the author of several award-winning books. Her most recent book, Democracy in Chains, The Deep History of the Radical Rights, Still Plan for America, is a New York Times bestseller. Some of you may remember, people of a certain vintage, <laughs> the doomsday clock that was created by atomic scientists to gauge the imminence of uh, a, a nuclear confrontation. For those who don't remember the doomsday clock, the hands on this old analog clock would move toward midnight as danger mounted. If we had an equivalent democracy clock today, I would estimate that we are about three minutes to midnight, or to use military language, DEFCON 2. So it's vital to appreciate what exactly we are up against and how it works. Today, Lisa and I will take on a piece of the overweening threat that we face, a piece that is lost in today's 24-7, shallow, horse race style mainstream media. And that is this question of how and why some U.S. billionaires are funding anti-feminism, global homophobia, and other attacks on democracy. But I want to be very clear with you that this is only one facet of a unified, integrated threat that operates on many different fronts. And the scale and integration and sophistication of this kind of threat has actually, and I say this as a historian, never been seen before. When Anna asked me over the summer to present in this series, this topic came immediately to mind. Uh, and that's because it's been gnawing at me since I published Democracy in Chains. That book told the story of how the Koch network of organizations has weaponized a particular school of thought into a strategy to transform politics and governance without ever having to win over a majority to the kind of corporate libertarian ideology uh, from which all this comes. And the reason that is important, not having to win over a majority to these ideas is that the architects of this effort know from repeated experience that would be impossible. So to put the key point in a nutshell, Charles Koch and his fellows learned from the Virginia School of Neoliberal Political Economy that they should concentrate instead on radical rules change at the state and national level, as well as in the courts and federal agencies and ultimately lock in these changes with uh, amendments to the constitution. They've used state laws uh, in particular and other tools to undermine collective power, particularly of labor unions, but also groups like Planned Parenthood. They have engaged in the uh, now 30 states that they control in the most radical and sophisticated redistricting efforts we've ever seen in our political history to overrepresent more conservative minorities and underrepresent uh, people of color and urban uh, and uh, liberal leaning suburban communities. They have passed uh, voter suppression measures, the likes of which this country has not seen uh, since the disenfranchisement of African American uh, voters at the turn of the century. Um, and they have undermined where they could independent state judiciaries, taken powers from democratic governors and so much more and they have worked to capture our federal courts with stunning success in the case of the US Supreme Court. They've been doing all of this in earnest for more than two decades now with catastrophic results that seem to mount by the day up to and including stopping action on the climate catastrophe, funding members of Congress, complicit in the big lie and the failed coup on January 6th, and underwriting the organizations that are now driving the frenzy over teaching the truth about our history under the rubric of critical race theory, which in fact is not taught <laughs> in uh, K through 12 schools as they uh, purport. One key element in their strategy though, has been alliances with the religious right that I only had uh, time to, to gesture to in the book. So I really wanna thank Anna for inviting me to collect uh, some thoughts and findings on this crudel, uh, critical topic, and also for being so excited at the prospect of inc including the amazing Lisa Graves, whose research has done so much to expose this menace and supply vital information to those in the trenches of trying to defend and renew democracy. 
So Lisa and I will be dividing up the presentation. Uh, first, I will uh, give you a sense of the reach and audacity of the billionaire efforts to weaponize homophobia uh, by profiling the transnational work of a group called the Alliance Defending Freedom. And then with that concrete example for you to think with, I will explain why pro-corporate and economic uh, liberty-minded billionaires like Charles Koch need the religious right. Then Lisa will turn to how they drive attacks on gender equity. And in the words of our mutual friend, Jasmine Banks of Uncoke My Campus, who I think is also on this call, uh, how they use, in this case, women as human shields for the billionaire's agenda. In that spirit, Lisa will share her organization's research on the also Orwellianly named Independent Women's Forum. The fig leaf of ideological consistency that enables the alliance of arch libertarians with would-be theocrats is a shared commitment to what they call lib religious liberty, with the liberty to discriminate being the prime one pursued. So just as claiming a First Amendment freedom of speech right enabled unlimited corporate dark money in the Citizens United case and rulings against unions, including Janus, so religious liberty litigation opens up judicial space against anti-discrimination enforcement and for tax-funded, unregulated private religious schools. So that may sound abstract. So I want to turn to a case study of how this works globally. I can't actually see you. I was going to ask how many have ever heard of the Alliance Defending Freedom. Um, uh, but my guess is perhaps not that many. Um, but the, uh, and the Alliance Defending Freedom is not the only such organization, but it is the central organization in international faith-based outreach for this newly claimed religious liberty. It was founded in 1994 by Alan Sears, who may be familiar to some of you as the author of an incendiary tract titled The Homosexual Agenda, Exposing the Principal Threat to Religious Freedom Today. Catherine Stewart, a journalist who has tracked the group's history, says, and I quote, the ADF and its allies are as radical as they are rich. Few outside the ranks of evangelical activists and their funders are familiar with the ADF, but it enjoys backing from uh, two organizations, which have been called by journalists, the Koch Network ATMs, Donors Trust and the Donors Capital Fund, as well as the DeVos Foundation, which is the family foundation of Betsy DeVos and her deceased uh, husband and, and uh, some other donors. With an annual income of more than $50 million, the ADF has dozens of attorneys on staff and a network of over 3,000 cooperating attorneys. Thanks to them, the ADF has helped to drive almost every major legal case in the United States that has advocated uh, a religious freedom to discriminate, whether against female employees seeking contraceptive coverage, in healthcare or against civil equal civil rights for LGBTQ citizens. It boasts of 53 victories in the US Supreme Court, among them the landmark cases, Lawrence versus Texas, Hobby Lobby and Masterpiece Cake Shop. ADF legal advocacy, advocacy for Christian liberty is now truly global. Its attorneys have waged litigation in some 60 nations and hosted over 2,000 law students from 21 countries for ADF legal fellowship training programs in the US. The organization has offices in Brussels, London, Mexico City, and New Delhi, among other places, with the locations chosen to be close to power centers, such as the Organization of American States, the United Nations, and the European Union's High Commissioner for Human Rights. ADF attorneys argued to the latter, to the U European Union's High Commissioner on Human Rights, and I quote, in favor of state-sanctioned sterilization for trans people, according to The Guardian. Their legal brief included this claim, equal dignity does not mean that every sexual orientation warrants equal respect. Stewart reports that the Alliance Defending Freedom exports the revolution, that is to supplant secular democracy with theologically informed 
religious liberty, I'm sorry, economic liberty for corporations. She notes that the ADF has demonstrated considerable skill in adapting to new cultural environments and political frameworks, much as one might add the multilateral, sorry, the multinational capitalists backing it must in order to succeed in their overseas profit-making enterprises. In the ADF's case, legal concepts that are developed in the United States are then spread through the world to make the case that the equitable treatment of LGBTQ citizens endangers religious freedom. There are now hundreds of organizations advancing this hard right program in the courts and um, uh, it, 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 in courts and, and, uh, and, and legislatures across the European continent and beyond. In Belize, the ADF worked with another group to criminalize gay sex. Together, they create the appearance of homegrown uprisings against what they call the gay agenda. Yet, notes Elena Zakarenko, a Brussels-based policy consultant, quote, it is the same individuals involved in the uh, many of the seemingly different organizations, which creates an impression of many different movements of masses of agitated citizens seeking these policy changes against the gays, even where there are no such local movements. In fact, the opposite is often true. Well-funded organizations in the United States throw up distractions to hide their dominance in these efforts. In fact, Picture this, because this is how they work. At the hub of all of this are ADF staff members housed in the group's Scottsdale, Arizona headquarters who are paid, who are paid to spend their days hunting the internet for potential overseas partners. In effect, what they do is look for embers in other countries on which they can pour gasoline. The organization also maintains foreign scouts, as they call them, to alert it to obscure cases that its legal team can assist. All of this, notes one scholar of the global right, quoting from the organization's own webpage, allows the ADF to be involved without appearing to be interlopers from America. Both Romania and Sweden have been sites of such ADF tactical guidance in the passage of hate speech protecting and discrimination enabling laws involving LGBTQ citizens in partnership with local anti-gay organizations. The local groups re represent only a tiny minority of public opinion, but with this powerful US backing, they have been able to amplify their work and achieve so-called free speech and religious liberty protections. So what we're seeing in the case of the ADF, to be clear, is a US-based effort on the part of would-be theocrats to both incite and leverage homophobia around the world to expand their cause. And that effort is underwritten by some of the richest men in the world, including some who never showed any religious commitment themselves, like Charles Koch. For his part, in fact, Charles Koch is abetting a right-wing Catholic campaign against Pope Francis, according to the Catholic reporter, including funding centers at more than two dozen US Catholic universities that actually teach against Catholic social do justice doctrine. But the ADF is just one of many organizations that exploit and inflame fear of women's power and of queer freedom to advance the overall agenda of the donors. So now let me pull back the lens to explain why those who are not themselves religious are backing these efforts. So why do arch right billionaires like Charles Koch who want to just transform global governance to their liking need the religious right? The answer is not obvious. After all, there was a time when Koch's Cato Institute stood up for abortion rights and called for ending penalties for sex between consenting individuals. But as the writer Lynn Par Paramore recently pointed out, the libertarian grantees have gone very quiet about their previous commitments. In September of this year, she asked in an article with this title, why aren't libertarians protesting the freedom-busting Texas abortion law? Paramore 
pointed to Ayn Rand, who did more than anyone else to popularize libertarianism. Rand said, uh, when abortion was still a crime, and I quote, abortion is a moral right, which should be left to the sole discretion of the woman involved. Morally, nothing other than her wish in the matter is to be considered. Who can conceivably have the right to dictate to her what disposition she is to make of the functions of her own body, end quote. Yet Paramore searched and found that not a single libertarian bigwig spoke out against this year's Texas anti-abortion law, which relies on vigilante bounty hunters to deny women this elementary moral right and freedom. There are reasons for that stunning silence from the self-styled liberty cause, however, reasons philosophical, practical, and electoral. As feminist scholars have argued, neoliberalism as a governing regime depends on social conservatism. And it has since F.A. Hayek convened the Mont Pelerin Society in 1947. They met, as Bethany Morton has pointed out, during Holy Week. And Hayek included the teaching of history, and the relationship between liberalism and Christianity among the three critical topics for the meeting. He believed that re-entrenching a 19th, 19th century style market economy and society would also require reinstilling religion. As Morton has shown, Hayek and many of his co-thinkers felt a need for religious faith to provide what she calls a soul to their defense of corporate freedom, a cause that otherwise would not seem especially transcendent or worthy of commitment. Morton demonstrates in her work how, and I quote, religious doctrine and devotion have been among the pr principal conduits for neoliberal ideas, policies, and practices, and how the market freedom of this cause has led to the entrenchment of what she rightly calls intimate forms of unfreedom. As scholars, including Linda Kintz and Kevin Cruz, have uh, alerted us, corporate donors see the value of particular variants of religion to their cause. That is why they have invested vast sums in individuals who produce a theology to abet their market fundamentalist project and in organizations that disseminate uh, to entrepreneurial clergy and voters that theology. Okay, so that's the philosophical reason in brief. Practically, those who seek to privatize public goods and services like education, healthcare, and so forth, need some other entity besides government to take up the slack. Throughout the neoliberal causes history, they have assumed that families would make their arch version of personal liberty possible. Again and again in the literature of neoliberalism, theorists talk about the individual, yet smuggle in the family. Melinda Cooper quotes Milton Friedman lecturing on this point. He said, this is really a family society, not an individual society. Why does that matter? Because Cooper explains, they want to return us to the older poor law tradition of private family provision. They rely on families and implicitly on the women in them to take up as unpaid care work what the government ceases to provide. Studies by feminist scholars have documented that that is precisely what's happened. That's part of why we face such a deep and urgent care crisis in America. Finally, electorally, only the very tiny sliver of the electorate believes in the kind of extreme economic liberty that these corporate donors seek. So that is why the Koch donor network in particular has cast its lot with the religious right along with the gun enthusiasts of the NRA. In contrast to their open radicalism in the 1970s, Koch operations now fly under the false flag of conservatism. They take pains to find common ground with the most arch of religious conservatives who also happen to be an ideal target audience because creationists, long denial of the science of evolution, prepared them well to accept Koch-led climate science denial, to say nothing of the big lies of voter fraud and Trump victory. This strategy 
this alliance strategy has brought them the most unquestioningly loyal base of GOP voters. So having given you the global example of the ADF, and I hope a sense of why these alliances matter and serve both parties to them at the rest of our expense, let me hand things over to Lisa Graves to report on the US operations of some of these groups. And let me say, uh, for those who don't know Lisa, that she is simply the best researcher we have on the corporate bad actor beat. And she is a democracy warrior extraordinaire. Her heroic and generous work brings to mind for me the story of the proverbial little Dutch boy who plugged his finger in the dike to hold back a flood. She does that every day, every week, every month, year after year. So I am so honored to welcome her to Duke. Lisa. Oh my goodness, Nancy, it's uh, such an honor to follow you and to be on this panel. And that, that was such a kind and generous introduction. I really, really appreciate it. Let me just begin uh, by saying when I when I uh, spoke with Nancy um, and she told me about uh, the research that she'd been doing about Alliance Defending Freedom, uh, one of the things that struck me was that um, Amy Coney Barrett, before she became a Supreme Court Justice just last year, uh, she was um, someone who was actually a paid speaker at uh, Alliance Defending Freedom's training grounds for lawyers. And I just want to um, share a bit about that for a moment because it's not, it's not it, I think it exemplifies how this group is so influential. <laughs> um, she was a paid speaker um, at least five times starting in 2011 with Alliance Defending, Defending Freedom's program called the Blackstone, Leader, Blackstone Legal Fellowship. Uh, and it was established to inspire quote, uh, a distinctly Christian worldview in every area of the law. That's according to their tax filings. It was founded uh, to show uh, people who are lawyers, um, <clears throat> uh, quote, how God can use them as judges, law professors, and practicing attorneys to help keep the door open for the spread of gospel in America. So in essence, to use their jobs to advance their religious beliefs. Now, um, Amy Coney Barrett has attested that she would never do such a thing, that she has no view, um, uh, that she would impose her personal views on the law. We've heard that those lines before from Brett Kavanaugh when he was nominated, uh, claimed he had no views that he would impose about Roe and then immediately, uh, uh, once he was confirmed, uh, took steps to help uh, begin the overturn of Roe versus Wade. Um, but it's also the case that uh, it's not just uh, that group. It certainly is that group that's playing such an influential role. Um, but there was a tremendous book that was uh, released just a couple of years ago by Elise Hogue and Ellie Langford from NARAL. It's called mm -hmm. The Lie That Binds. And it really detailed uh, some of these uh, connections um, and how, as Nancy said, uh, the right wing um, and the libertarian right have, have joined forces. And I'd be remiss if I didn't say to you that uh, one of the most salient reports I've ever seen about this was just published by the Washington Post mm -hmm. uh, just this past weekend in the Washington Post magazine. It's a piece uh, written by Robert O'Hara, a, a great and longtime investigative journalist for the Post. Um, it's called uh, God, Trump, uh, and, and uh, the, secret, um, the Secret Workings of the Council on National Policy. I think it has a slightly different title online now, but it's about the Council on National Policy. And that's story that he wrote uh, really tells the story of this, uh, this effort that began with Paul Weirich, who, who Nancy mentioned, uh, and others who decided that Ronald Reagan wasn't going to be far enough to the right for them, and they needed to deploy um, the evangelical Christians in the country to really dominate government policy. Um, at one point, um, early in the Reagan administration, by the way, as, as Robert O'Hara points out, uh, David Stockman, who was, I think, then like 35 years old and was the budget director, the notorious budget director for the Reagan administration, came to a Council of National Policy meeting to talk about how Reagan wasn't putting enough, in a, they weren't putting enough um, right-wing Christians into, into positions of power. And um, at that point, uh, uh, in essence, uh, uh, what was not said was that David Stockman was also a divinity student. So he was one of those appointees that was, that was basically there because of, uh, in essence, a religious uh, test for office. 
Um, and one of the goals was to try to get uh, more people like him into key positions of power. And to fast forward to the present, as, as uh, Robert O'Hara reported uh, in the Post this weekend, uh, and has been reported by documented uh, investigations, document.net, which I co-founded, but which I did not report on I, uh, recently, uh, documented um, has noted, and, and Robert O'Hara has noted that um, one of the things that happened in the Trump administration was that Council on National Policy groups were working to basically help determine who was getting appointments in the Trump administration. And the, the story that Robert O'Hara tells is really about how um, there was the skepticism of Trump in 2016 by some people who um, uh, had said that they were against uh, someone of Trump's uh, morality, uh, in essence, or his track with his track record, but how they were convinced that he was the man who would deliver them the agenda they wanted, particularly in packing the U.S. Supreme Court. So, um, as Nancy said, you know Charles Koch uh, and some of the Koch libertarians have talked about how their pro-choice, and in fact, the Libertarian Party was founded in 1971 um, with a stated uh, object objective of supporting uh, women's reproductive rights. But the reality is, is that uh, almost every political um, elected official that Charles Koch has backed, that his groups, Americans for Prosperity, have aided, that his other dark money operations have pushed, have been you know, deeply anti-choice, um, deeply desirous of overturning Roe. Um, and so you can have, a, you can have a, some PR about how you have a position of being pro-choice, but the reality is, is that almost every, every candidate they back is anti-choice, and so it really means nothing. Uh, I believe that the words are um, cheap and the action is much more demonstrative. Um, <clears throat> Charles Koch is in his 80s now, but he's been at this since the 1960s. And uh, one of the things that, uh, that I've helped uh, uncover is how long Charles Koch has been attempting to re-engineer America, uh, re-engineer the United States to shape his worldview. And that includes very early, uh, early funding of what was called at the time anarcho-capitalist theories. Almost 60 years ago, Charles Koch attended the Freedom School, which taught the anarcho-capitalist theories of Robert Lefebvre, and he became a funder of that school. So Charles Koch was part of that too. As well as part of funding for the John Birch Society, it wasn't just his father who was a uh, initial leader, co-leader of the, of the John Birch Society, but Charles Koch himself was a funder of the John Birch Society. And you know, at that time, ability to the United Nations, its attacks on uh, John, President John Kennedy. But what it, what the bulk of its materials were focused on was attacking the civil rights movement in the United States. And so, as Charles Koch was funding the John Birch Society, it was actively attacking uh, Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. and Rosa Parks. It was actively attacking uh, the civil rights movement and equality uh, efforts to gain equality. That was its core focus. He ultimately left the John Birch Society um, over Vietnam, not over its attacks on Reverend, Reverend Martin Luther King. Um, and this is one of the things he was quoted on early on in his career, where he was uh, uh, speaking to his group, the uh, IHS, the, the so-called Institute for Humane Studies, which was an, is another institute, uh, libertarian institution that's now housed at George Mason. And I think it's important to note, like this, this is a broad attack, an attack on taxation. They think he, he, his position was that tax was theft, wage and price controls, you know, minimum wage, um, including their so-called equal opportunity requirements. Those are his words, right? Those aren't my words. This is Charles Koch in 1974 attacking equal opportunity requirements and so much more, <clears throat> including licensing laws. You're probably hearing a lot about attacks on licensing laws. Uh, that's an a ongoing part of that Koch agenda. But um, this was 1974 and really nothing much has changed uh, since then. Um, what has changed um, and, and Uncoke My Campus has been instrumental in uncloaking this is how um, Koch has been so effective at pushing his agenda through universities uh, and basically buying uh, control, buying access, buying control, buying influence through universities in addition to um, his uh, tremendous efforts to uh, really distort our elections uh, on overdrive for the past um, 11 years, but really uh, dating back to his uh, efforts to fund the Libertarian Party in the 70s and his 
a dark money trial balloon back in the 1990s. It was called the triad operation. It's definitely, definitely worth looking up. I'm not gonna read this slide uh, to folks here, but suffice it to say that um, if you wanna know more about how um, Coke has been operating on campus, uh, you should definitely look up Uncoke My Campus. Um, I wanna pause before moving forward just to talk a bit about this, this gap between the, the stated uh, philosophical purity uh, or claims by Coke's PR machine and the reality. So um, this chart is derived from, uh, from a report by the Washington Post that came out after the 2012 election. In that election, there was an operation that Coke uh, helped uh, spearhead uh, that he led, he advanced after the Citizens United decision of the Supreme Court. And that group, uh, a group was very active in the 2012 election and no one besides the Coke operation and Coke operatives knew what it was, knew that it even existed. It was called Freedom Partners. Um, it's, it then became Seminar Network. Now it's called Stand Together, some version of Stand Together, Chamber of Commerce. But at the time it was this sort of disposable group that uh, that's name was Freedom Partners. And if you look at that, um, that green line, but you can see a thing called um, Aura LLC. Uh, $5 million went to Aura LLC. So they, they were using these sort of um, LLCs to mask uh, some of their operations. And, and in, on this point, you can see direct funding uh, by Charles Koch's um, uh, political operation, which was Freedom Partners, to this, um, to this entity called Aura, which was, which was closely tied to another obscure entity. I'm gonna, pardon me for the um, acronyms here. It was called Evange, R4, sorry, it's E-V-A-N-G-C-H-R-4. You know, I think it's pretty clear it stands for Evangel Christians for something, trust. In a one year period, that was $5 million that went to Aura and a substantial amount of money went into this particular trust. What did that trust fund? It funded the Family Research Council Action, which is part of the Family Research Council. And what did Family Research Council Action do? It hired Josh Duggar. Uh, Josh Duggar, who is from the Duggar family fame and has infamy for his own uh, uh, criminal activity. Um, that's what happened. Uh, that money went into funding FRC's political arm to try to help get Republicans elected to office. Uh, it, was, uh, it was described as general support, but the reality is, is that it was instrumentally involved in their efforts to deploy evangelical Christians to advance the GOP agenda. So one of the, we know for sure that uh, they received you know, a six figure sum, um, but beyond that, that's not all. They were also funding um, other, uh, other groups, uh, including, the, um, <clears throat> including Focus on the Family um, and other uh, right-wing Christian organizations. Um, and, you know, part of that, as Nancy said, um, is about this notion of restoring the family to its original purpose. Um, in fact, that's, um, that's one of the uh, things that uh, another group, um, another group that uh, has been funded by Freedom Partners, Cook's Freedom Partners, Concerned Women for America, has described as its primary objective. And it's also notable, and I'll end on this point in terms of the Coke agenda, that that money included $1.3 million to a, a thing called Citizen Link, which aided focus on the family in voter mobilization and candidate training in its strident opposition to gay marriage and to legal abortion. So, you know, there's a myth about this libertarian uh, uh, support for women's equality or women's autonomy, and it's just not real when it comes to actual dollars. Part of this money, and I'm gonna just make this as a very brief point, supporting um, <clears throat> Leonard Leo and uh, Leonard Leo's, um, what Charles Koch's groups called the under the dome strategy, basically to uh, try to capture the US Supreme Court. Uh, he describes that as restoring the quote rule of law. This is, these are all terms that mean nothing that an ordinary person would think they mean. They actually mean reversing um, a decade of precedent, decades, decades of precedent, I should say. And in fact, um, Robert O'Hara wrote a piece a couple of years ago in May of 2018, where he um, uh, revealed that Leonard Leo had spoken to Council on National Policy, that group I mentioned, that is the subject of this most recent article by Robert O'Hara, that that group um, had, had uh, received Leonard Leo shortly after the confirmation of Brett Kavanaugh 
And um, at that meeting, right, at that meeting, Leonard Leo told the funders, the right-wing funders assembled there, which did not include Koch, uh, but which included many others, that because of these appointments by Donald Trump, this is before Amy Coney Barrett, um, the U.S. Supreme Court was on the precipice of what he called a revival of what he dubbed the structural constitution that would result in uh, reversals of precedent, changes in law unseen for nearly a hundred years, basically going back to the Robert Barron era uh, before the New Deal. That's you know uh, basically um, mapping out an assault on the, the modern precedents that have actually breathed life into the terms of our constitution that prior courts had disregarded like equal protection of the law in the 14th amendment. Um, so there's definitely more to the story about Leonard Leo, his uh, working with um, these dark money groups, uh, some of which are include the Independent Women's Voice, uh, who I'm gonna talk about in a, in a moment here and focus on, um, but also um, other parts of this operation have now been rebranded, redubbed, different names. But if you go to our website, True North Research, you can see our report on the nomination of Amy Coney Barrett. You can see more about the groups that were um, uh, deployed to back these nominees and, and uh, to back uh, the packing of the court by Donald Trump. Um, and uh, there are important details there. Um, I'm going to use that as a bridge to talking about the fact that one of the things we uncovered last year was that the leader of the Independent Women's Voice and Independent Women's Forum um, was, uh, is a woman named Heather Higgins. The Independent Women's Forum, um, Independent Women's, Women's Voice is a group uh, that is very active in U.S. politics, um, very active in advancing an anti-feminist agenda. And um, although it describes itself as a group that's concerned about all women's issues, that all women's issues, all issues are women's issues. Um, the fact is, is that this organization um, has, has long received Koch funding. It actually was um, co-located for a period uh, with uh, Americans for Prosperity, Koch's uh, 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 signature political operation that was both when it's called Americans for Prosperity and its predecessor name, which was Citizens for a Sound Economy. So at that time, this was uh, in the early 2000s, IWF was actually co-led by the former leader of Koch's um, lobbying team uh, of Koch Public Sector for Koch Industries, which is one of the which is one of the largest public privately held corporations in the world, and which is the company that has made um, Charles Koch one of the richest men in the world. And so here you have a, a right wing women's group that was funded, fueled, directed by one of the people who was one of the right hand lobbyists for um, Charles Koch and his agenda in Washington. Um, but that's not all. There's been recent funding uh, by Charles Koch's operations of IWF and IWV. And they are groups that have, uh, have taken very extreme positions. Um, as Nancy said in, in describing their name as, or as Orwellian, I, I, uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly because um, one of the things that Heather Higgins has told donors uh, in a video that I, I found um, about her speaking to the David Horowitz uh, group was that um, one of their, I'm gonna paraphrase here, but one of their um, uh, uh, pluses, one of their advantages is because of their branding, meaning the word independent, people don't know that they're really right-wing, that they're really so-called conservatives, um, but the people who, who do need to know, meaning the funders know that they are. So they are able to traffic with this brand of independence. And one of the things that IWF has done, IWF and IWV has done, has, has to claim that they don't have any position on choice. Uh, meanwhile, um, after, uh, after some of these um, Senate candidates have made really outlandish statements against women's reproductive choice, um, they, have been, um, they, they have played a central role in helping them, um, in helping them to get uh, elected. So for example, um, back in 20, I think it was 2012, um, U.S. Senate candidate Todd Akin claimed that rape victims couldn't get pregnant because if it was legitimate rape, the female body has ways to shut, to try to shut that whole thing down. I'm sure you remember that statement. He made that statement in August of that election year. Um, IWV afterwards spent thousands of dollars on robocalls to try to help Aiken win. Um, similarly, that year, uh, it, during the year of the war on women uh, candidates, uh, uh, U.S. Senate candidate Richard Murdoch 
um, said that when a woman became pregnant due to rape, she was carrying a gift from God and that the pregnancy was something God intended to happen. Two weeks later, the Independent Women's Voice spent $176,000 plus dollars on ads supporting Mordock. Um, it's also supported Donald Trump, despite numerous misogynistic statements he's made, including about boasting about inspecting beauty contests, dressing rooms, and the sexual assault allegations against him. Um, in 2016, IWF and IWB specifically targeted women in Wisconsin in the two weeks before the 2016 election, and then took credit for Trump's win. And they claimed that but for their efforts, Trump would have received an estimated 215,840 fewer votes in Wisconsin. That was, those are the words of Heather Higgins. Um, and as I said, they've also actively supported Brett Kavanaugh and other, um, other Trump numbers of the court. Um, they even attacked Christine Blasey Ford, uh, calling her accusations of publicity stunt um, and attacking her credibility uh, personally. Um, this is really no surprise to me because the roots of IWF um, are in defending Clarence Thomas in the face of Anita Hill's testimony that he made sexually explicit and repulsive overtures toward her when he was her boss and mentor. So um, what is IWF doing now? What are they up to lately? Uh, well, they were very active in the Virginia election uh, this past, these past few weeks, uh, creating a site called about, you know, so-called toxic schools, attacking McAuliffe, trying to fuel the um, uh, division and false claims in my view about uh, critical race theory being taught uh, in public schools, which is not the case. Um, as, one of my, as one of my friends said, if, you're, if your child is being taught critical race theory, congratulations, they're in law school already. Um, and that's not even what's taught in all law schools. It's an elective class in some law schools. And so um, they've been fueling that disinformation campaign as well as uh, attacks on masks for kids. Um, they uh, played a lot of, uh, pu pushed a lot of uh, PR this past year in attacking uh, public health protections in response to the pandemic. Um, and they really are um, a pay to play organization that brings together um, both this right wing uh, sort of social agenda with this uh, corporate agenda of Coke and the Coke world, which is, you know, attacking uh, government regulations, attacking efforts to mitigate climate change, attacking efforts to regulate um, uh, Juul and vaping, uh, Juul funds them, uh, attacking efforts to regulate fracking, on and on and on. Um, but that's not all. And I think I'll, I'll end on this note in terms of IWF. Um, one of the things that, um, and this is very important to me, and so I, it's, it's not a conclusion uh, at, at the, at, put at the end because it's not important. It's actually one of the most important things, which is that IWF and IWB have you know, strongly opposed women's economic equality policies, including paid leave and attacking the Build Back Better plan, but you know, long before that attacking uh, paid sick leave for women and families, uh, they've attacked uh, equal pay. Uh, they routinely, uh, write an write a, uh, op-ed op opposing the Equal Pay Act, attacking the idea that there's any pay gap. Um, they've attacked Title IX, which has been transformational for women's equality in the United States. First years back, taking the sides of men's hockey teams in college against women's athletics, and most recently attacking the US women's soccer team and its efforts to secure equal pay. And it also has um, actively opposed the adoption of the Equal Rights Amendment and hailed Phyllis Schlafly when she was alive and posthumously for her leadership on that issue. This is an issue where, just so you know, only 5% of the American population opposes the adoption of the ERA. But where is the so-called Independent Women's Forum and Independent Women's Voice staunchly opposing the adoption of the ERA? And in fact, just this past a week in Congress, they testified against the adoption of the ERA. And so you have a right-wing women's group that's very tied to the Coke fortune, a very tied to right-wing dark money operations, very tied to helping to pack the Supreme Court that has again and again and again taken positions that fundamentally harm the interests of women while posing as an independent group that really represents women's opportunity. I wholeheartedly disagree. Um, but I'm glad to have had the chance to share with you this concrete example, as Nancy said, of the way one of these operations works in the United States to um, oppose women's economic opportunity and women's uh, political equality um, and women's genuine equality. Uh, what you have in the, in the roots of Koch's agenda 
has been an effort to basically um, uh, limit the ability of people in a democracy to pass laws that constrain corporations, that would limit the power of corporations, that would tax corporations, that would impose environmental protections or equal opportunity laws or what have you. And, and then you have this uh, effort by uh, groups tied to Coke, people tied to Coke, some of them, not all of them, to dramatically uh, change US election law. Uh, Charles Koch helped underwrite uh, the litigation that resulted in the Buckley versus Vallejo decision back in 1976 that began the notion that money is speech and should not be, cannot be limited under our constitution that culminated in the Citizens United decision, which then unleashed this massive you know, uh, well over a billion dollars of spending by the Koch network to try to capture elections. And now you have many of the politicians that Koch has backed, um, uh, that Koch's operation, Americans for Prosperity has helped. They're at the center of um, efforts to make it harder for Americans to vote. And then finally, um, and not only finally, but finally for my purposes in this part, you have America, the American Legislative Exchange Council, or ALEC, which is a major Koch-funded operation who has been helping to spread uh, this big lie, or what I call the big lucrative lie, <laughs> about the election to try to, change, um, to try to change the way our elections are run, to try to change what was, what was demonstrably the most secure election uh, most monitored election in U.S. history in 2020 with huge turnout in, an, in a pandemic over enormous obstacles thrown up by Koch operatives um, in legislatures. Um, and, uh, and yet you have this wave this year of efforts to make it hard to vote. So what can you do? What can we do? Uh, well, the first part is knowledge, uh, learning about knowing what's happening. And the second part is um, personally, speaking personally, we are going to have to ensure that everyone who has a right to vote can vote, does vote, and make sure those votes are actually counted and not set aside by extreme partisans who are backed by uh, some of these Koch operations. Nancy? And I think Lisa captured it. You know, I think the exposure is crucial because they want to be able to operate in the dark, right? And to not have people know that they use disinformation as a strategy and that they're rigging the rules. So I think the more that we can expose that, and you know, and that includes things like calling up your, your radio or TV station, you know, if they're missing the point on something they're reporting on, letters to the editor, informing your organizations, all of those things are, are crucial. And also uh, supporting the democracy reform legislation like the the uh, Freedom to Vote Act. That, that is absolutely critical. Uh, have any of you done a comparable analysis to measure the capacity of the Democrats' political and funding network to resist the Koch network? Uh, I can say, yeah, that there are uh, democratic um, uh, efforts, fundraising efforts to try to counter this. Um, there are national efforts. There's also state-based efforts. Um, they're wonderful, you know, and they're developing and growing, but they are, uh, first of all, nowhere near as well-funded as those on the right, nor are they as strategic as those on the right. So I think one of our challenges on the progressive side is that we continue to operate in different issue silos, right? You know, people who are working on the environment or civil rights or union rights or, you know, um, queer politics or, you know, all these different things without kind of cross-pollinating to say, hey, you know what? We all depend on a functioning, transparent democracy answerable to the people to achieve the things that we need to. And so I think that that has begun to change in recent years. Ironically, I think Trump's election really woke people up, you know, and, and generated all the indivisible groups and others that are so, you know, heavily um, driven by women who are alarmed at all of this. Uh, but but it's really important to have those uh, organizations kind of um, break down the barriers among them, support one another's efforts, and all, for all of us to think more strategically. You know, so sometimes there might be a particular thing that seems like absolutely the right thing we must fight on this, but we also need to be thinking the other side is very strategic in how they do what they do. Um, so, so it's important for us to do this. And I, I'll say too, because I saw there was also a question about race, which we might take mm -hmm. up separately, but um, Dima, the think tank Demos has done some pretty, pretty powerful, uh, important work on what they call the race class narrative. And you could actually look that up and see it. But what they found in messaging is that if you just push, say, a kind of class based issues narrative that doesn't address 
um, the, the, the weaponizing of race by the right. Or if you just address the racial justice issue, you actually lose not only with white voters, but with also with African-American and Latinx voters. Um, but if you put together um, the, the economic justice and the racial justice vision in what they call race class fusion to say, hey, look, you know, um, you know, whatever our backgrounds, we all need, you know, whatever it is, healthcare, this, that, and the other, but we have very wealthy people who are trying to pit us against one another, you know, as with these ridiculous critical race theory attacks that are clearly going to be the 20. 22 Republican election strategy, you know, we have people who are trying to divide us um, and that language, you know, and they've poll tested it and done it at the doors, that language really works. So I would refer people to that too, because it's absolutely clear that this kind of um, uh, race baiting, uh, um, uh, racializing of elections is going to be the strategy in, in 2022 and 2024 for, uh, and, and also I think we have to say here, which I, I'm realizing neither one of us us really did, but I'm sure you've kind of figured this out, many of you on your own, but this donor money um, and the way it's been used to inflame the Republican base has created a pincers action that has made the Republican Party a delivery vehicle for all that we're talking about, right? So there really is no more independence. And that's why, you know, to so many people's shock, there was so little condemnation of the big lie or of January 6th, the, you know, the failed coup attempt because the Republican elected officials are so afraid of the donors and of that inflamed base who work together to keep them in line. And I, I would just add one thing to what Nancy said and defer to her on, uh, on her analysis of that, which is, yeah, I think that there are, um, you know, tremendous some tremendous leaders in Congress who are trying to move forward reforms. Both the, mm -hmm. uh, as Nancy said, the um, the 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 John Lewis uh, Voting Rights Act and the um, and the S one, you know, uh, effort to to basically uncloak this dark money. And certainly, Senator Sheldon Whitehouse is one of those leaders just tremendous, doing tremendous work to try to help expose what's happening and help reform it, but he's not alone. There are many people in, in both houses of Congress that see uh, this crisis unfolding, at, as Nancy said, at DEF CON 2, is that right? <laughs> DEF CON 3, um, that, uh, um, that, are, that are trying to fix it. And obviously there are some challenges in that because you have a united Republican party opposing uh, reform in reality, whatever they may say about, you know, to a reporter as a matter of votes, they are not allowing these things to move forward. And you have um, a couple of members of the Democratic Party, like Joe Manchin, who's an ALEC alum, uh, who are, are thwarting these reforms that are vital to save our democracy from the dustbin of history. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I want to ask another question. It's uh, how many uh, kind of companies and operations Coke actually owns and funds and how he is creating an alternative universe, an alternative audience with an alternative kind of alternative language. Actually, it's a very important one. Can you can you talk about that? So, so I'll just say on that question of um, Coke um, Industries, there's a very good book about Coke Industries and how secretive it is, how long it's funded uh, uh, climate to mile. It's actually back on my bookshelf right there, Coke Land. But what's interesting is the author of that doesn't even touch the, the international operations of the Coke network. So it's in at least 60 countries with over 60,000 employees, you know, many of them uh, fossil fuel states. So, so it really could use more uh, research as could all of these things. Lisa, what would you say in response to that question? Also this um, question that Anna posed about, you know, even when we use the same words, <laughs> these folks are repurposing the words to mean something very different. Well, let me, let me take that, uh, that, sec that last part first. It's definitely the case, for example, that, that the right wing uses the word freedom to mean a lot of things that aren't really freedom um, and, uh, and to basically uh, abnegate responsibility, uh, mutuality, our shared interest in a functioning society. Um, in terms of the, the, the you know, scope of Coke, what Coke's control, I mean, certainly Coke Industries is a massive company that Chris Leonard details um, its reach and also notes that, you know, a, a much, much of its new wealth is coming from Wall Street, not necessarily uh, from uh, the core pipeline operations and, and uh, Georgia Pacific and the sort of brick and mortar stuff. But um, there's that in terms of the, the other organizations that he has funded, um, they're manifold. Um, and as Nancy said, they're both 
uh, abroad through the Atlas Network and other operations in numerous countries. And they're all over the United States um, in every state almost, if not all of them. Um, and a lot of these big national groups have major Koch funding and have had, have had major Koch funding for years. And then there's his political operation, um, which is led by Americas for Prosperity and then has a couple other brands under Concerned Veterans for America, Libre to focus, Latin, focus on Latino voters, um, his alliance with United Negro, Negro College Fund for scholarships that, that basically focus on identifying libertarian African-American students uh, to advance into their network. Um, but uh, the other part that Koch has been funding has been a media operation, media fellowships. Mm -hmm. And it's one of the main, has been one of the main funders of Tucker Carlson's uh, nonprofit uh, group uh, through the Daily Caller news operation that he uh, helped launch. Um, and so um, there are efforts to trace it. Jane Mayer, obviously in her um, breakthrough book, Dark Money, you know, really helped do the first major uncloaking of that. Other organizations like Greenpeace, you know, Desmog, Blog, uh, Source Watch, Senior for Media Democracy, my organization that I'm the president of, um, have played a key role in uh, exposing them. But um, uh, Anna, to, your, to, to answer your question more succinctly, there's no one-stop shopping that details all of those groups. We've tried to capture some of that at cokedocs.org, one of my sites, but that's a site that's in uh, the building phase and hasn't uh, really mapped everything out. Um, but there's a lot more to be done to really see what's gonna happen uh, uh, post Charles Koch. His brother died a couple, uh, two years ago. Um, he's older now and apparently in very good health. But he is not the type of leader who's uh, who's who's left who's not leaving behind a structure. He's left behind one of the deepest, uh, most widespread structures for advancing his agenda from beyond the grave that I've ever seen of any uh, rich person uh, in the United States. Um, and on that point, I just want to conclude uh, by saying one of the things that I think historians may observe looking back on this period after the fact is how some of these billionaires have become, have created sort of a post-state political environment. Where they're not really aligned to the um, sort of native or the uh, structures or processes of, of the country in which they made their fortune. They attempt to transcend laws of countries. Countries, many countries have less, uh, less wealth than Charles Koch. Um, they are sort of countries unto themselves and they're alliance toward this um, uh, anarcho-capitalist view of the world, you know, sort of transcends national boundaries. And as Nancy documented so compellingly, they've been at this for many, many years to try to uh, transform other countries' constitutions to limit their ability to regulate corporations.